And uh, with that being said, I'd like to introduce our next speaker for this evening. Um, so she is a medical biotechnologist uh, with a PhD in uh, cancer research. Um, and she'll be talking today about uh, extending uh, DNA analysis. So please welcome Anna Mulner. Well, thank you for being here. And um, yeah, and for the kind of introduction. So just a quick recap. Um, I'm a biologist by training and um, did my PhD in cancer research. Now I work as a PR consultant for healthcare as my day job. And um, I'm also a science communicator. And this is seen as something of science communication has nothing to do with my day job. Um, and I wish to talk to you about DNA. You've probably heard of it. And um, it stores our genetic information. So it's a different kind of code than most people here are used to. Um, it's made up of four bases, adenine, thymine, guanine, and cytosine, which are usually abbreviated A, T, G, and C. And as you can see in the image, the um, adenine always binds thymine, and guanine always binds cytosine, and vice versa. And um, so you have two uh, negative of one positive code always. And there's coding and non-coding DNA. So the coding DNA is actually genes, so everything that shows up in your looks. And the non-coding DNA is not genes, so everything outside of your genes. Both are important. And um, DNA, you might have heard, is also used as evidence in crimes, whereas 99.9% .9 of our DNA is the same, which is a good thing, because otherwise we would all be mutants. 0.1% um, is different and differs from person to person. And in 1984, Alec Jeffries discovered DNA profiling, where he saw that he could use this 0.1% to... Um, identify people. And this is possible to compare the DNA profile of one person with another person, and can also be used to find relatives for paternity issues, for example. And um, often this is referred to as DNA fingerprints. And what this really means is checking for short tandem repeats, or STRs. And these STRs are repetitive sequences outside of genes, so they have nothing to do with how we look like. Um, and there are many STRs with different lengths, which are inherited. And the pattern of these STRs differs from person to person. And basically, it just looks like this, that you have, for example, the repeat CTA five times, or six times, or nine times. And um, the number of the repeats is the thing that differs. Um, if you look at the gene then, this could look something like this, and basically you just count the number of the repeats. So each box here represents a repeat, sometimes you have a similar one, and uh, the same number, and sometimes you have different numbers. What do you do to get a DNA fingerprint is first that you isolate the DNA from a crime scene or from a probe, you amplify these STRs, and then you can separate them by their size, because the different number of repeats generates a different size of the amplified sequence. And this you do to 16 STRs, and then you get a profile that looks something like this, which you might have seen in the TV series already. And um, what I said was that the DNA fingerprints don't really show how you look like. However, in... Um, because they are outside of genes. However, um, as you may remember, we have um, chromosomes, and on these, uh, two of these chromosomes are the so-called sex chromosomes, and these are called X and Y, and um, you can identify the X chromosomes and the Y chromosomes by the gene of the enamel, of our tooth enamel,
And um, since 2004, we can use this to identify the sex chromosomes of a person because the X chromosome um, gene is six bases shorter. But this is not always accurate. So this is how um, the DNA fingerprint then looks like in the um, for the scientists, this is an electropherogram, basically just the measurements of the ba bands that you just saw. And um, you can also see on the, up, uh, on the lower left the X chromosome peak, um, and you see there's no Y chromosome peak, so this person has two X chromosomes. And this is just a means of identification, so it does not show much about the person besides the sex chromosomes, where you can determine the sex of the person. And um, in 2016, there was a rape case in Freiburg, and actually a rape murder, where Maria L. was found raped and murdered at the Dreisam River, river in Baden-Württemberg. And after a long search, they found one hair that was found in a hedge, and it was 18 centimeters long, and it was dyed blonde. And um, on a surveillance video of a um, tram, they could find a person that fit this profile of this hair style, uh, which led to an arrest. This was a 17-year-old Afghan refugee, and um, he confessed that he committed the crime. And afterwards, the police said that with, with extended DNA analysis, the murderer could have been found much sooner. But what is this extended DNA analysis? There is now a new law um, to, um, it, yeah, to come, so not already here yet, but proposed by Baden-Württemberg, which is now governed by the Green Party, and Bavaria, which is con governed by the conservative party, CSU. Um, and they wish to draw more conclusions from our DNA. So they want to look at the eye color, the hair color, the skin color, and the biological age. And um, the Conservative Party also wants to look at the biogeographical ancestry that can be determined from the DNA. And um, this is basically just a synonym for ethnicity, and some may even say for race. And... Um, the law for extended DNA analysis is often referred to as the DNA facial composite. And, um, however, in science terms, it's called forensic DNA phenotyping. And um, this means that you look at genes which de determine the looks or other characteristics of a person um, just from the DNA and the genes. So um, what you do here is that you check for single nucleotide polymorphisms, or call, uh, also called SNPs. And these SNPs are basically just single base mutations that you can he see here, the A and the C. Um, they can um, be everywhere in the DNA. And um, with genome-wide association studies, or GWAS, you can um, associate SNPs with a phenotype. So some people who have a C here would look different than people who have an A, or have a different trait. These SNPs, however, do not have to be causal. They can just be a correlation, a statistical correlation. Um, this looks like this um, in our graphic here. Um, if you have, um, for example, the same SNP here for each person, but a different one for each person here, or for these persons, the two, first two are the same and the third one differs. But in the genes, you could maybe determine from the SNPs um, the blonde hair of this person, um, the brown hair of the second person, and the uh, uh, red hair of the third person. Or the blue eyes of the first person, the brown eyes of the second person, and the green eyes of the third person. SNP analysis is basically just done by um, checking for a known sequence, and then you have labeled bases, and you can check which base binds here. Um, this can be done by next-generation sequencing, which is a quick form of uh, sequencing DNA and a very novel technique. Um, 
and um, you can do multiple SNP analysis, so you can check for uh, several SNPs at once, so it's quite fast, and it just gives you a statistical correlation of which person has which SNPs, and, um, and it looks like what. And um, soon, maybe, we could also do whole genome sequencing and then check for um, the bases uh, that are mutated. The accuracy, um, if you check for the biogeographic ancestry, if you just go for continental ancestry, this is about 99%. So um, you can determine if you're European or African or Native American, for example. But um, what you get sometimes from the media, 20% Spanish or 20% Turkish or something, that doesn't work. That's too complicated. However, hair color can be determined with an accuracy between 70 to 90%. So in 70 to 90%, the um, result will be correct. Um, Eye color, the result for blue or brown hair will be correct in over 90% of the cases. Intermediate forms will be correct in about 70% of the cases. And skin color will be correct um, in about 80 to 90% of the cases. Um, to check for this more closely, here are some examples from a paper by Kaiser et al. And um, you can see here that for the brown hair, um, this was not quite as sure. So it was something between brown and black. Um, the dark shade of the skin, however, was determined correctly at about 80% um, certainty. And the brown, hair, uh, brown eyes were also correct with over 90% certainty. Um, for the brown-haired person here, you have about 66% uh, likelihood for brown hair. And um, also, it could have gone even um, black or blonde here. Um, the shade here was not quite as accurate. It was 50-50. And um, for brown, hair, uh, brown eyes, it was 72% likelihood of accuracy. And... Um, this blonde person here had um, about 62% accuracy of the blonde hair, 97% um, of accuracy for the light shade of the skin, and also 95% accuracy of the blue eyes. So this was quite um, accurate, this prediction. And here, um, the red-haired person of 92% red hair. However, for the st skin tone, again, this was quite undecided. So it was, again, 50-50. So it's dangerous to draw a conclusion here just because one is higher than the other. And also for the brown hair, the uh, brown eyes, there was just 46% certainty here. Then you can uh, check for the biological age, which you can do doing uh, checking for the DNA methylation patterns. So our DNA is modified by methyl groups, and um, this can be done to so-called age-specific CPG islands. So CPG islands are just a quick repetition between, uh, of C and G before a gene. So in front of a gene, and these can regulate the expression of a gene. So um, if a gene is later brought up in your looks, and um, this some uh, kind of looks like this, that you have, for example, an older person on the top who has um, has methylated um, CPG islands in front of the genes. However. Um, a younger person in the middle who doesn't have age-specific um, CPG methylation and an intermediate age for a person with um, just this one methylation. Um, you can analyze this um, during doing a chemical treatment of the DNA. So your DNA, um, which has been methylated at the cytosine, um, that is um, treated, and then you get um, a change of base if it was unmethylated. So you can see in the lower part, it is um, changed to a different base called uracil. And then you can sequence the DNA and see how much it was exchanged. Um, the accuracy here, um, there is a mean error about three to five years, um, but some results will have up to 20 years um, errors. And um, there are... Um, 
some diseases that con confound the results, for example, cancer or anemia. And also it's a problem because this is tissue-specific methylation if you have mixed tissues. So usually this is done from blood and saliva. And um, if you have a mixture of other tissues, then this can be more inaccurate. So basically what's advertised if you hear the term DNA facial composite is this facial composite here. But, um, so this is probably the first thing that people think. However, the reality is more something like this. Um, and uh, maybe you have a little bit the age of these persons, and then only maybe. And I'd like now for you to look around you and see how many people fit either of these profiles, and just to determine this for you for a second. Um, and um, so this is just an approximation of the phenotype. And um, as you might remember or know even, the DNA does not have to equal the phenotype. So people who have black hair in young years might have gray hair now. Um, some people are born black and are later of a different skin color. And some people may well have XY chromosomes, but are female. And um, other factors may also be, um, for example, kids who have blonde hair and grow up to be dark-haired adults. Also, hair color is always very, very easy to change, and purple is not in our genes. Um, and also, mixed ancestry, so having ancestors from different continents of the world is also a problem often with determining the ancestry. But there are more problems with forensic DNA phenotyping. And the first thing and most important ethical problem is the suspicion reversal. So um, the police usually has to prove that you're guilty. But if you're a suspect just due to your looks, then with the extended DNA analysis, you will be a non-suspect person of interest. And um, so you will be kind of connected to the crime or to the probe without having done anything. And now you have to prove that you're innocent. And um, Victor Thom, a social scientist from uh, Frankfurt, he said, suspicionless seizure of persons and then demanding proof of that person's innocence inverts our structural arrangement of power between law enforcement and the individual. So um, this is one of the most important things that you see here um, with uh, forensic DNA phenotyping. And um, oftentimes, science is supposed to equal facts. And DNA is an unbiased witness because it's infallible and factual, because it's based on science and it's done by scientists. However, you have only an estimation about how people could possibly look like. And um, therefore, it has to be interpreted by a human being. And is, therefore, it's prone to bias. And one of the most important biases here is the confirmation bias. And um, I have to say that everyone and each of us, however aware we feel we are, we are always biased. That's how our brain works. And our brain likes to think more positively and not so much negatively. So if we anticipate an outcome, we are more likely to prove that this outcome is true. If we, we pay selective attention to items of interest and disregard the contradictory information, just unwillingly, and we will have a positivity bias. So we like to confirm what we think is true. And also, if we have heard something before, we think it's more true. It doesn't make sense, but it's how our brain works. But therefore, DNA is not an unbiased witness. And also, there's a question of privacy here. So the law's hypothesis is that openly visible features determined from the DNA are not private 
And however, here the appearance does not equal the statistical correlation. And also if you have a real witness who saw your features, you have more context and you can say, for example, the person was fleeing the scene or something. Um, genes on the looks and biogeographic background will always tell us more than we ask. And uh, the most important maybe is skin color, so fair skin is much more likely to get skin cancer or darker skinned people have a higher risk for heart disease and um, also age is a factor for many diseases. Then um, I'd like to come to the point of discrimination. So by definition, forensic DNA phenotyping discriminates people with different ethnicities. So um, if you think about it, the relevant suspect group will always be the minority of the people who actually live in this area. Because if you find the looks of the predominant population, this will be too large of a suspect group. And um, openly discussed forensic DNA phenotypes of a DNA trace to a crime will probably lead to more hate crimes or add to the hate crimes that are already um, in place here. And so if deployed, forensic DNA phenotyping needs to be confidential and needs to avoid stigmatization of whole subpopulations. And um, therefore, the debate here is always very emotional because the forensic DNA phenotyping law was proposed after a very brutal rape case. And the first people who demanded forensic DNA phenotyping were actually right extremism groups. And um, the new law probably would have not helped um, the investigation because the perpetrator had strikingly dyed hair and that was the reason he was identified on the surveillance video. The outlook, actually, for forensic DNA phenotyping, it's getting more accurate. So people are trying now to determine the body height, the body stature, hair loss, so if you're a bald person, the hair structure, and also the face structure, and you can actually see um, on the image, approximations of face structure based on uh, SNP analysis. So extended DNA analysis whole, uses the whole genome-wide uh, association studies to approximate looks, age, biogeographical ancestry, and maybe soon much more. And um, it is not a means of identification but approximation. And by definition, it's discriminatory and it will target minorities. And um, since it is biased, it can always lead into the wrong direction. So what can be done here? Uh, forens if forensic DNA phenotyping is to come, um, there's o only as a method of F last resort when everything else has failed. It has to be confidential, so there are no hate crimes due to this investigation. And uh, precautions have to be done to avoid confirmation bias. Because no one and nothing is infallible, and no one is unbiased, and every wrongful investigation of a suspect leaves the real perpetrator unprosecuted. So back to the new law. So the conference of ministers in, um, of eternal affairs, the in-minister conference, uh, supports this law inside of the security package. And Herbert Reul, the interior minister of um, North Rhine Westphalia, NRW, he said, Nobody understands why forensic scientists can form a very precise facial composite from very small traces, but our police cannot use them. Well, maybe now you understand. So I'd like to uh, thank you very much for your attention.
And um, if you'd like to know more about me, you can find me on my website. And if you want to know more about forensic DNA phenotyping and ethical issues with this, um, Professor Veronika and Anna Lippard are doing very great work on this at the University of Freiburg. And this is their website. And I'm now open for questions. So, thank you very much for an interesting talk. If you have any questions, there are two microphones on each of the aisles. And first question from microphone number four. Um, I wanted to ask how clean eventually the DNA sample should be to proceed with this procedure. It probably has to be very, very clean because I'm not quite sure how easy you can determine, uh, distinguish them. I think it should be completely clean. So if you have maybe DNA from a rape which is mingled with the victim's DNA, it's difficult to get this out. However, if you can con um, control it with comparing it with the DNA of the victim, then maybe um, it can be done a little bit more accurately. Question from the internet. Yep, the internet wants to know what's your opinion about um, using DNA fingerprint of uh, someone as a like, public key to identify persons on a distributed uh, ledger technology network. <laughs> I don't know what a distributed ledger technology <laughs> network is. This is the next question. Uh, may, <laughs> maybe um, you can ask this uh, question um, on my blog. Just send me an email and we can d discuss this. Um, using it as identification for something, I think right now is not really feasible because to do it accurately, you need someone to, um, to do it for you in a scientific lab under specific circumstances. And um, if you have DNA from someone else on your fingers, maybe you transfer this DNA and suddenly your identification doesn't work anymore. So um, and this would be what I would be thinking about this. Microphone number two. Thank you for your very good talk. Um, Thank you. My question is, um, there seems to be a great difference between the opinion of science, how uh, we should use this technology, and the uh, politicians. Mm -hmm. um, and this kind of conflict I guess, could only be um, fought by the scientists against the politicians. Is there a kind of movement of scientists who say, well, what the politicians say, that we should use this, and it's so uh, secure and not uh, uh, without any bias. Is there a movement who say they mm -hmm. are talking bullshit? So this is basically what Veronika and Anna Lippard would be saying. They are not saying they are talking bullshit because they're raising awareness for the problems. And um, so I would never say <laughs> um, something like that. But um, um, if there are also scientists who propose um, to use this as um, as uh, as help in forensic investigations, because a lot of us scientists we are very um, well. We, we don't look at, at the world as many people do. We think of it actually as, well, this is just data and it's just an approximation. Of course, people know this is an approximation. And um, so we would be thinking, so if the DNA is of a blonde-haired person, of course, they would just be paying more attention to blonde-haired person. But if there is a brown-haired person who is uh, very much connected to the person in question, then you might um, even pay attention to this, even though the DNA analysis said something else. Uh, just because scientists are aware that the DNA can be wrong. Um, I'm not saying that there aren't people who also understand that the DNA can lead us into the wrong direction, even in, in the police force and everywhere. But history has taught us that people a lot of times tend to go where um, the science lead them, leads them here. And um, if the science has not been as accurate at that, that point, then maybe it doesn't, um, yeah, uh, it won't really work in this case. Okay. Number three. Hi, thanks a lot for your talk. Thank and you. And I just wondered if you create a profile on the features, say, hair color, skin color, eye color, and each of the features has a probability of something like 0.7 to be correct, and you multiply those um, probabilities up, 
you will end up with a much lower probability for the whole profile to be actually right, something like maybe 25 or 30 percent or so. And so I wonder whether there are actually any ideas how this method should be used in practice for the police. And on the other hand, um, what uh, value this kind of profile should have in court then? Um, well, the um, value in court, I think, is that um, it's not really of value in court because it does not identify you. It's of value during the investigation. So on the very beginning of starting to look for uh, who is responsible for the crime. Um, therefore, in the end, then you would still have the DNA trace of the DNA fingerprint and then you can still compare this uh, to the person that you have found. And um, if this doesn't match, then this person could go free, hopefully. And um, comparing the um, probabilities here or multiplying them, then you just, um, you just narrow down on something. You will never be able to narrow down on just um, two uh, persons and then they are, um, you just have to pick one or test them both for their DNA profiles. So um, I would be careful here to just um, multiply the, um, the probabilities. Any last questions? And if not, then a big round of applause for a great talk. Thank you very much.